Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Good morning, Family Church. It's good to be with you today. For those of you who uh, may not know me, I am Pastor Michael. I am the Celebrate Recovery Pastor here at Family Church. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. You know, I, I, I consider this just such a privilege and an honor to be able to uh, be with you all this morning uh, as we continue with this series we call Celebrate Life. You know, and, you know, as I'm sitting down there during worship, there's that song, you know, you are more than able. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? You know, and I spent too many years doing that in, in my own life. So I just love our worship team. Uh, Pastor Chris does such a great job. Um, you know, they really just helped me get into that position and that posture to receive everything that God has for me today. You know, so... And I'll tell you, it, it wasn't always like that for me. Um, the very first time I attended service here, um, Pastor Mike's mom, Miss Lynn, preached that night. It was a Saturday night. Um, so when she was here for Mother's Day a couple months back and she, she preached, it, it brought back a very special feeling and a very special emotion for me because it, it, was, it brought up memories for me that were very positive. Um, you know, and not, not because of her message, you know, in particular. Um, Miss Lynn, if you're watching, sorry, I don't remember what your message was about. Um, but, you know, it was more, um, it was special because it was the beginning of my serious walk with God and the journey of my recovery. Um, you know, and I didn't really connect with the worship team back then, uh, to be honest with you. I, you know, I came in here. You know, and this was kind of my posture. I was sitting over in here somewhere, you know, standing there like this, looking around at all the lights, the smoke machine, and the weird curved ceiling. I was like, what is that all about? I don't know what's going on. This place is a little over the top, I think. I don't know about this. This doesn't seem like church. So, you know, in fact, after that first service, my wife continually always invited me uh, to church. I said, yeah, you know, I think I, I'll go again. Um, but can't we go after the music part? Uh, you know, that was kind of weird and awkward for me. People were yelling, glory and hallelujah. And I was like, yeah, it was too cringy. I was just very uncomfortable. But I was a different person back then. You know, I was, I was unsaved. I was in the throes of addiction. Uh, I was a broken person listening to that sermon that night. But God. But God. You know, the, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So let me pray. So, Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word and come together as a family. I pray these words are seeds that will fall on good ground. So give us those ears to hear, the eyes to see the plans that you have for each and every one of us, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, so as a Celebrate Repastor, you know, Celebrate Recovery Pastor here, you know, I get to connect with a lot of people, with many people, uh, members of our church, um, members of other churches, um, some, some people with no church connection at all. You know, but, and my connection usually starts and deals with some aspect of pain in their lives. You know, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, listen, nobody ever walked into a recovery meeting for the first time because they had a great day. It, it just doesn't happen. You know, it's like, you know, I don't have any dandelions on my lawn. 
Little Billy got straight C's in school today. And my car is getting 38 miles to the gallon. I think I'll go to a recovery meeting tonight. <laughs> Nobody ever said that. Their motivation to summon up the courage to come, and, and it is a very courageous act, is centered around two ideas. One, they have a hurt, a hang up, a habit, uh, causing pain in their lives. And two, they're seeking some kind of answers. Many don't even know what they're looking for, but they're just seeking something. Some are dealing with addictions, you know, to a lot of things. You know, not necessarily drugs and alcohol either. You know, uh, nationally and statistically, only one in three people attend Celebrate Recovery are there for a chemical addiction. You know, issues come in, in many forms. You know, they come in the form of financial issues, sex, food. You know, when I say food, I'm particularly sugar. 15 years doing this, I've never seen anybody battling a spinach addiction yet. <laughs> you know, <coughs> but codependency is another one. Anger is another one. Pandemics as of four years ago. You thought you were immune from the problems of this world. I think the COVID-19 proved that uh, completely wrong. You know, so your hurts, your hang-ups, your habits. You know, these issues I just mentioned, they're, they're just the habits. You know, habits are simply symptoms of underlying problems in your life. They all start as hurts, uh, many times at a very young age. You know, the hurt grows into a hang-up. And then as we age, we all reach for or develop some kind of coping mechanism to deal with the internal pain. And that is the habit. You know, one of my earliest significant childhood memories uh, centered around a hurt. I was maybe three or four years old. You know, when I experience that loss of innocence and realize that there are people in this world that I just can't trust. The very first one. You know, that hurt developed into a hang-up, and I looked for an answer. You know, a habit. For me, that copanism um, turned into drugs and alcohol. But I do, I do not focus on the habit anymore. You know, um, anybody can quit drinking, you know, for a time. You know, staying quit, that is the trick. You know, I learned I had to figure out why I started and why it developed into such a dependency in my life. You know, when I first met, um, first came here and I first heard Miss Lynn preach, it was way back at the end of 2007. I was a hot mess, folks. Let me tell you, I'm a, you know, I had very few sober moments. You know, my marriage was falling apart. My family life was struggling. I had no per, uh, personal connection to God. I was old and fat. I'm not this felt and youthful person you see standing before you today. <laughs> well, maybe not that felt, but we're working on it. I had goals, though, back then. I had goals. You know what my goals looked like at the end of 2007? If at the end of the day, when I laid my head on the pillow and I was still breathing and I was not in jail, I had a pretty good day. That was the bar. If I didn't do anything stupid enough that day to hurt myself or to hurt somebody else, I was relatively content at the end of the day. But God... But God, you know, he knew, God knew the plans he had for me even back then and before I ever existed. You know, this scripture I want to look at comes from the book of Jeremiah also, and it's in chapter 1, verse 5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now, Jeremiah... Jeremiah lived in difficult times. You know, he was a priest, and as such, he preached from the time of the reign of Judah's last good king 
to sometime after the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. Difficult times, right? Despite his efforts, Jeremiah's preaching did not stop the nation's slide into exile. Good people driven from their homes and into exile. So I want to look at that scripture again, but I want to start in, in verse 4 this time. In Jeremiah it says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, so this is, you know, Jeremiah knows he's getting a word from God. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I appointed you. That sounds great, right? If you're going to be appointed by somebody, who better than God, right? But what is Jeremiah's response? Verse 6. Jeremiah starts with, alas, or probably more like, alas. You know, if anybody starts a response like that with the word alas, you can probably bet what follows is not going to be very life-giving and positive. You know, it's like starting a sentence with, you know, no offense. But I'm probably going to say something you can choose to be offended about. So Jeremiah says, alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So even though Jeremiah had experience preaching, right? He was a priest. He knew the written word of God. He spoke in front of crowds before. Still, he came up with an excuse not to do it immediately. Alas, I'm too young. I don't know how to speak. Really? Jeremiah grew up in a town called Anathab. And the town he grew up in was two to four miles, like, northeast of Jerusalem. So he grew up in the capital city and its temple. Everything that was happening, Christianity-wise, was happening around that area. Jeremiah's initial response, though, is still to disqualify himself because of his age. Have, any, have we ever done this? I know I have. We are presented with an opportunity, uh, and the first thing we think of or, or to do is come up with a reason why it's not going to work. Why is it going to fail? But let's be reminded what God says. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. You know, I don't know everything, but I know those plans do not include failure. But I get Jeremiah's response. I mean, I understand it all too well because I've done it. I've done it multiple times in my life. And there are two reasons I believe that we do this. You know, I believe that every single issue, every wrong belief we have, every single doubt in ourselves will fall into one of two categories. And that is the failures from our past and the fears for our future. You know, when I first got saved, you know, not long after 2007, um, and I really got serious about my walk with God and, and my own recovery, these two issue buckets weighed very heavily on my life and my day-to-day -day existence. You know, do, they do not go away instantly. You know, early on in my recovery, I started to, you know, see some real improvement in my life. I was attending Celebrate Recovery at another church. We didn't have it here then. You know, and I was at an event with Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe and Miss Lynn, Pastor Mike's parents. Um, and me and Pastor Joe were standing there chatting about motorcycles. We were talking about whatever. And I don't know if you ever met Pastor Joe, you know, uh, but he is the biggest man I've, I've ever met spiritually. And no offense, Pastor Joe, but he only comes up to about here on me, right? You know, I'm 6'2", so, he, but he's a, he's a huge spiritual guy in my life. 
So we're standing there talking, and he says, he smacks me on the arm, says, hey, Mike, when are you going to start one of those things here? I said, what, those things? I thought we were talking about motorcycles. What are we talking about here? He goes, you know, that thing you go to over there, that church. I said, you mean celebrate recovery? He goes, yeah, yeah, I want you to think about starting one here at this church. We need that here. So, you know, I was standing there, smiling at Pastor Joe, <laughs> nodding, you know, and everything in my being was screaming, no, 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 no. I continue to smile and nod. So I'm thinking, you know, I can't be a, a ministry leader in this thing. You know, I'm unqualified. I'm not qualified to do that. You know, I have, I've made way too many mistakes in my life. You know, like scrambling. What, how do I get out of this conversation? You know, what do I say? I, I, I know. I'll tell them I'm a baby Christian and I don't know the Bible well enough. Or I know I've heard somebody else say this. Let me pray about it, Pastor Joe. <laughs> But this flood of reasons not to do it just avalanched in my brain instantly. Failures from my past, fears for my future. So I continued to nod and smile at Pastor Joe, and I told him, you know, let me, let me go home and talk to my wife, Sue, about it, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you, Pastor Joe. You know, of course, I went home, and I... You know, if you guys ever met my wife, you know, she's like, I told her about it. She's, oh, my God, that's awesome. Uh, she got all giddy and excited. And when we start, you know, can we have a meeting about it? We should talk about it. Let's make an appointment. And I smiled and nodded at my wife. I said, woman, you are out of your mind. But I want you to understand something about my beautiful wife. You know, through some of the darkest times of my addiction, she never lost sight of the person that she met and married many years ago. Amen. You know, even against the advice of many people at the time that were telling her what to do, she knew I was not that addiction. You know, she knew that underneath that was the person that she met and I will forever be grateful to her for that. <laughs> so, family, let me tell you, your spouse is not your enemy. Right? You are not each other's enemies. You know, your spouse, you know, he may have some issues, she may have some issues, but you are not each other's enemies. So thankfully, you know, what I had learned about God to that point uh, in my, my walk and, and the never ceasing love and encouragement from my wife, you know, I just learned to be willing. So we decided to meet with Pastor John. I said, all right, <laughs> you know, we'll give it a try and we'll see what happens. So there's three points I want to leave you with about all this today. Point number one is you are not defined by your past. You are not defined by your past. Listen, the failures from your past are always going to be there. Listen, you know, your past is your past. It ain't going anywhere. You know, you are not the addictions. You are not your mistakes. You know, we are covered by the blood and God sees us through the eyes of Jesus 24 hours a day. Period. You know, I wish I could tell you, come on out to celebrate recovery and we'll make your past disappear. That sounds like an infomercial at 2 a.m. on television, right? And if you act now, we'll throw in the magic misery eraser <laughs> for free. It don't work like that. You know, I can tell you that we can help you confront your past and come to some peace with it. And that's what I had to do. And I never liked confrontation. I always avoided it. I didn't let people get too close to me because I didn't want them to see the real me. 
you know, but I, uh, you know, thanks to my pastor, Pastor Mike, he did a, a sermon on this. You know, and confront simply means forehead to forehead. You got to get right with your past, stare it right in the face, and come to grips with it once and for all. And that's what we do at Celebrate Recovery. You know, and I don't wallow in my past. You know, I don't sit around telling old war stories, but I never want to forget what it taught me. Amen. Right? And I love this because if you were to erase all the mistakes of your past, you would also erase all the wisdom of your present. Amen. Remember the lesson. Remember the lesson, not the disappointment. And we all make mistakes, folks. We're not, we're imperfect human beings, you know. But when we make a mistake the first time, it's a mistake. You do the same thing again, the second time it's a choice. It's no longer a mistake. Ouch. Point number two, fearing the future is a waste of precious time. Yep. Another word for that is worry, right? And we all do it. We all write these stories in our heads that, you know, about what we think is going to happen. You know, people with phobias do it a lot. You know, people, you know, if you have a fear of flying, media stories will tell you, if I get on a plane, I'm going to die. But statistics tell us that there is a commercial plane crash every 16.7 million flights. That means for every one million flights, 0 0.06 planes crash. You know, that's like a chip of paint coming off the wing or something. I don't know. But those are pretty good odds in my, in my opinion. So I tell people all the time, look, if you're worrying about what might happen because the story you wrote to yourself there's a simple solution. Stop writing those stories. You're welcome. You know, the day, last day I got arrested was one of the best days of my life. It wasn't such a great day that day. But, you know, so maybe what you think might happen, happens. You might be right. Maybe there is some consequences that God knows we need to endure so that we can grow. They're called growing pains for a reason. You know, maybe your worrying and intervening is getting in the way of that. You know, the day I got arrested, like I said, it was, the, it was one of the things that jolted me into reality. I said, like, this ain't normal. You're like, you, you shouldn't be living like this. You got to do something and make a change. So when I look back on that, you know, I, I think about it as a good day today. Plus, Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So let's worry about today, folks, and we'll worry about tomorrow when, it, when it's the present and not the future. My third and final point on all this is the only time you can make effective change in your life is in the present. You know, Jeremiah really had to trust God's word when it came to him. You know, in 1 8, God's word says, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Behold, I have put words in your mouth. So that whole I don't know how to speak thing, that just went out the window. Everything you say is said in the present. Everything you ever have said was said in the present, and everything you ever will say will be said in the present. So your words are very important. You know, when I, when I stop being fearful about what I could not do as a Celebrate Recovery ministry leader, I started to simply become willing to be willing. All right, let's give it a try. And I trust that now. I really do trust that. I completely trust that God has my back, that he always has a plan and a purpose for my life, and that that plan is good. Yeah. 
So, if you're faced with some of this stuff, with these past failures, these future fears, you know, and you're disqualifying yourself from being used by God, I want to encourage you to stop believing those lies. I believe we can all be used by God to advance his kingdom, and all it takes is a little willingness. You know, God used what, what this world would call, you know, some kind of screwed up people in this world that would label them as that, unqualified, and he used them to do mighty things that are still being talked about thousands of years later. You know, the Bible is full of those stories of people who look like misfits, but God used them to do incredible things. So don't sell yourself short. Don't sell yourself short. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and it is good. But there is work we need to do. Maybe some changes we need to make in our life. You know, listen, I don't believe, you know, God expects us to stand there leaning on a shovel, praying for a hole. You, you pray that prayer to God and God's probably going to say, get up off your butt, put your foot on that shovel and start digging. Right? Get to work. Get to work because you're worth that work. So my big idea today is it's okay to feel like you're not okay. It's okay to seek help. It's okay to, you know, stop calling yourself one of those people. I'm one of those people, folks. One of the biggest ones. And I got news for you. You're all one of those people. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, but you are. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God, and that's okay. So if that is you, and you're ready to make some changes, I know a great place to begin that work, and it's right here in this building every Thursday night from 7 to 9. It's called Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> you know, after we step out of our denial... You know, and admit we got a problem. You can't fix something you don't admit is there. The next step is to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. A loving, personal relationship with Jesus. Now, this does not mean that your problems are instantly going to vanish and never return. It does mean your eternity is guaranteed and that you can call on the name of Jesus Christ anytime, day or night in time of need. So, if you've never asked, had the opportunity to ask Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior, we would like to offer that to you right now. Um, we're not going to make anybody stand up or come to the front. We, we simply pray this prayer together out loud, and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life, into my heart, to change me and make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 